thank you, Cecilia, for your presentation. Now, uh, Malika, Sumini, and I, we will elaborate uh, on the concept of intellectual monopolization. First, recalling a bit the theoretical framework of this literature, and then um, describing some other strate dominant strategies of uh, intellectual monopolies, and then uh, talking about the relation between national and corporate innovation system, and to conclude with dragging some conclusion with respect to the geopolitics of both the green and digital transition. To be very brief, like the traditional uh, Schumpeterian theory of innovation is based on the concept of creative destruction, where uh, innovation is the driving force of the economic system of growth, and where any firm can innovate and um, get some temporary benefits from that, but with a fast process of imitation and diffusion, in the end, the econ um, all uh, the uh, competitors will catch up, catch up, but Schumpeters was already uh, aware that the first mover has, can rely on some sort of, of advantage to get some more lasting uh, benefit, and so um, uh, causing a slower process of imitation and innovation. The literature of uh, intellectual monopolies is um, new because uh, it argues that uh, the first mover, the big first the intellectual monopolies, uh, can capture a flow, uh, a lasting flow of rents, um, creating some barriers to uh, the access of knowledge, even though uh, they allow a high rate of entrance to like startups and other innovative firms within the system of innovation. And in particular, with the ICT um, revolution, this has been possible thank thanks to the possibility of uh, turning intangibles into assets, and also on the institutional level, thanks to uh, the weakening of the antitrust regulation and some restriction with respect to intellectual property rights. And this is the reason why just uh, looking, for, looking at patent indicators is not enough to detect intellectual monopolies, but we should also look for evidence of control without ownership. Uh, for example, looking at uh, network relations, uh, portfolio uh, diversification, and um, joint ventures. The, um, um, the result of the huge power of intellectual monopolies is that they are able to influence the general direction of uh, science and research, um, basing that on uh, expected profitability rather than social needs and demand. Thank you. Um, to continue, we would like to briefly summarize the CIS dominant strategies uh, that are discussed in the paper by Recap in 2022. Uh, mainly, there are four of them. The first one is the feminist, uh, frenemy strategy used by Microsoft. Uh, so what they do as was uh, mentioned before that they collaborate with their competitors, including the open AI. Uh, they also include Chinese firms and other competitors, and they create the, the, this type of relationship where they are friends, but at the same time enemies that keeps them both, uh, that, that helps them to maintain their competitive edge in the landscape of, of AI. And then the second one is the university strategy that is mostly used by Google. Um, it is based on the um, integrating the, the, the all the very good uh, universities and academic institutions that uh, most of which, not most of which, but few of which specialize in science and technology, and that's how uh, they co-produce, co but at the same time appropriate this AI knowledge. And um, this, th this would not directly translate into, you know, business returns, but this does expand their dominance in the, in the uh, formulating and shaping the A AI knowledge. The third one was the secrecy strategy used by Amazon. So uh, they, they, they keep the, their AI research under some, somehow or full transparency uh, by emphasizing their um, non-disclosure agreements as well as privacy. And the last one was uh, the application center strategy used by Facebook. And it is also highlighted in the, in the paper that in comparison to these three big tech companies, Facebook is um, 
Facebook strategy is somehow not as big as the other three. Um, going further uh, is, uh, of course, these strategies, they bring a lot of benefits for the companies in terms of uh, the expansion of their intellectual monopolies, but uh, to the rest of the world, it, it may bring a lot of uh, threats, you may say, such as the concentration of power that leads to power asymmetry, as well as uh, different types of inequality including economic inequality there are also there is also a possibility of geopolitical imbalances regulatory challenges and of course the weaponization of technology um, but um, the story does not finish here. What uh, we, we try to observe what can be other strategies, not necessarily used, uh, not necessarily the strategies that they integrate in their corporate innovation system, but also some kind of uh, different pillars that help them to expand their uh, intellectual monopoly. And we found that uh, there's also uh, they also adopted another strategy, which we we can refer to as the ethical AI strategy. Uh, which helps them to, uh, which they practically use as a tool to avoid regulations. Uh, so uh, we found this paper by Ochigami in 2019, where he highlights that uh, they, the, the invention of um, the invention of uh, AI ethics was mostly just to help these uh, big tech companies to further. Uh, um, ex to further expand their power and acquire the lobbying power as well as the acquisitions for market control. And they do it with, for example, big financial funding investments such as the 27 million of USD ethics and governance of AI fund. But uh, the, the, the author also criticizes as such that uh, these companies, they collaborated with the former um, MIT lab uh, director Joichi Ito, who was also um, uh, who, who who in part uh, together with Harvard and uh, created this fund, and also uh, they worked on the development of uh, the ethics of AI. But then uh, the the concerns here are the concerns here are that. Uh, the, the, the main financial sources of this fund were these cor corporations as well as another ver very controversial figure, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, so uh, we're not really sure uh, that, you know, they are actually using these ethics of AI to um, bring some kind of social benefit. And uh, also, if you look at the, at the principles of Google AI, they w you would see things like, you know, um, principles like social benefit, transparency, accountability, and many other. But, uh, and they also say that we are aware of this, um, we are aware of the challenges that this kind of technology might bring. But we, uh, they describe their commitment to developing this technology responsibly. And then they, they take and fire the AI researchers they have who speak up about those challenges that might occur with this type of technology. Uh, maybe some of you know, but there was this famous conflict where they fired their, uh, their AI research who was well known for, for the work in AI development as well as the, the ethical AI development. And uh, she... Uh, she co-published co uh, a paper where they talked about the ethical, the ethical concerns about uh, the the AI technology and development, and they just fired her. Um, going further. Um, now, uh, this is about the how uh, these companies also use their technological monopoly, or in other words, the, the technological infrastructure they have uh, to also be uh, crucial actors when it comes to policy process making. We found a paper by uh, these guys, <laughs> which is about uh, how, the, uh, how big tech is becoming uh, a crucial actor in terms of the policy policy process all around the world. And uh, they use this MSF uh, multiple stream framework in policy process where the main, th the main uh, three streams are the, the problem, policy and politics. And they found that um, when it comes to the problem stream, uh, the companies, they act as epistemic community uh, uh, doing a lot of R&D, being uh, very active in academia in terms of the co-production of AI knowledge and its appropriation. And they also use uh, media 
for example, the Washington Post uh, uh, is largely controlled by Amazon, and so are a few other uh, media and um, social media platforms as well. So they take these uh, platforms and uh, they control the narratives of AI, again, when it comes to data management concerns. And then uh, there's also the policy stream where they, uh, they act as uh, uh, instrument to constitute the policy. Uh, for example, uh, they, they provide that uh, this tech-driven solutions for societal uh, benefits. And um, they, they are also indirectly or directly replacing the role of governments and public institutions when it comes to solving, uh, not sol necessarily solving, but dealing with some uh, social dimensions of development. For example, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, they heavily invested and they heavily work when it comes to education and public health. Which, uh, which could be a case of how uh, they are trying to replace, uh, um, not necessarily replace, but again, uh, expand their political influence as well. And then the politics stream, uh, in the politics stream what they do is they, for example, employ the ex-politicians of different countries and they make their, them the representative of their political party in the corporation. Or they, they, uh, they are also uh, big political uh, funders when it comes to the EU in, and in the US. And there's also direct political consultations uh, and for instance would be uh, the, the case of COVID-19 when the UK government, they invited many of the representatives of these big corporations uh, to help them design the, the tech solutions to deal with this pandemic and the vaccination process. Okay, so we're gonna pivot a bit here and bring in another key actor that is very important to this discussion and shows us just how much power big tech intellectual monopolies yield with AI. And that is the military, or more specifically, the U.S. national security state, which Linda Wise defines as a complex of agencies, programs, and hybrid arrangements that have developed around the institution of permanent defense preparedness and the pursuit of technological supremacy. So think of, of course, we discussed this before, like the Department of Defense, the CIA, but this is an entire huge network. So historically, post-World War II, the U.S. NSS was actually the strategic engine of innovation in the U.S., and not just innovation for the military-industrial complex, but they were also the key planner of all innovation. Uh, Linda Wise characterized this ecosystem as governed interdependence because it was co-developed with private actors, but the NSS defined the priorities and the directionality of technological change. And this worked at such a scale, especially because of the deep pockets and the very hands-on role of the U.S. state. I won't get into how and why the tables turned, but we know that this is no longer true. Um, Dr. Recap talked about this extensively, but today innovation and AI is planned by US big tech. But the NSS is still an important actor in this story. War is a profitable business and AI is um, the most coveted military technology today. And this means that the US NSS and big tech are heavily implicated with each other. And this is a glimpse of what that relationship looks like. According to Brown University's Cost of War project, just between 2019 and 2022, contracts to big tech were worth at least 53 billion US dollars, which is also a severe underestimate um, because many of these are classified and the details remain opaque. From what is known, um, these multi-year, multi-billion dollar contracts range from the provision of cloud services to the development of AI-enabled surveillance technologies. Um, Dr. Recap, uh, characterizes these relationships as frenemies for a number of reasons. Part of this tension comes from the fact that they have different goals and defense is just one vertical for big tech and they're not necessarily reliant on the military for their survival. The second is concerns um, from the US NSS that these intellectual monopolies links with the corporate innovation systems in China may ultimately aid Chinese military AI capabilities. And finally, there's also concerns of weaponized interdependence. Ultimately, what Dr. Recap argues is that although the relationship between the US NSS and big tech is favorable to both parties, the power here is unbalanced. The NSS is increasingly dependent on the expertise and the cooperation of these firms for even the most basic functions in the pursuit of American primacy. But big tech isn't reliant on the state in the same way because they have other means to achieve their goals like lobbying, for example. 
So these are several key takeaways from this paper. One is the recognition that the military industrial complex is no longer indispensable for major technological change. But they're still an important actor in the innovation system, and that is dangerous for the trajectory of AI. We will see this in one second in our case study. Um, and the second takeaway is that innovation is and always has been planned. But the question is, who gets to plan and for what aim? Um, we've seen both of these things change over time, and it opens up the space for us to think about an alternative. And this is especially important at present because frontier AI and big tech's implications with defense is not just limited to the US, but it is global. And this case study of Gaza highlights just how disastrous the consequences are when the decision of who gets to plan AI and for what aim are left in the hands of a few. Um, in the interest of time, I won't spend a lot of time talking about the context of um, Palestine, I think we all are all aware. Um, but it is important for us now, especially because this seminar is also about the ecological transition um, and ecological breakdown, to also recognize that Gaza is not just a humanitarian crisis, it is also an environmental one. And we cannot discuss the green transition without talking of how war is implicated in it. So, to get into it, there is significant evidence to support the claim that Israeli military capabilities are directly supported in various forms by US big tech. The most famous example, um, which Dr. Recap also touched on, is Project Nimbus, a 1.2 billion US dollar contract between the Israeli government and military and Google and Amazon, which provides Israel with advanced cloud infrastructure and AI capabilities, including facial detection, automated image characterization, and object tracking. Um, there have been others, including the use of Google Photos to power biometric surveillance and Amazon Web Services um, for server infrastructure that boosts computational resources for intelligence and surveillance operations. Um, investigations have alleged that these services have directly supported the establishment of the IDF's AI-powered systems, Lavender, Gospel, and Where's Daddy? These AI systems function by analyzing vast amounts of data to rapidly identify and characterize potential targets. Lavender uses machine learning um, to, identify, to identify and classify people as targets, whereas Gospel focuses on identifying buildings and structures for attack, and whereas Daddy is used to specifically track these targeted individuals, um, especially in, in the context of family residencies. And this places... Um, big tech and their AI trajectory at the center of humanitarian ecological breakdown. I won't spend a lot of um, time on these two slides just because we have already talked about um, the techno solutionist capture with regards, to, um, uh, with regards to big tech, but um, on the next one. Of course, um, given all this context, if we do not want um, a big tech plan transition, we cannot underscore the importance of democratically planning AI. Um, and what we see today is that the power of, um, these are just two examples of intellectual monopoly workers have no real say in how their labor is appropriated. A great example again is the fact that over 50 workers who were post Google's involvement in Project Nimbus were just fired. Um, and you also see on the other side the fact that the ever-expanding power of big tech undermines the capacity of the state um, to truly facilitate a truly democratic planning of AI. Um, and one example of this um, is the fact that the 2023 US exec executive AI order, um, where successful lobbying ensured that the only the uses of AI were regulated um, and not the production of AI, essentially giving free leeway to uh, big tech companies. Um, which again leaves us again with a question of if the state is an unreliable actor in this process, where do we begin to truly think of uh, democratic uh, planning of AI? And also, we need to add another piece to this puzzle, which is the role of China. The papers we were given to prepare the discussion for today uh, focus mainly on the US big tech, but uh, Ludva and Recap has also, uh, have also worked on China and described China catching up in AI as the result of the coevolution of the corporate and national innovation system in China. And also, uh, China is positioning itself as the main competitor with the US in both the digital and green transition. In fact, like here we just took uh, to charts about like the number of patents, well, even though like Cecilia explained why uh, they are not enough, but we can see that the um, 
patent granted to China both in AI and in renewable energy innovations uh, overcome, overtake the ones from the US and the rest of the world. And also uh, Urban has um, found evidence for uh, a, te a technological transfer that has been happening from China to other uh, global south countries and even to um, global north country. So what's the role of China? And consider that uh, the gap in both the digital and green transition between global north and, so and global south is a fact. Uh, here we can compare uh, a map with uh, the shows um, all the countries that have introduced any sort of policy or uh, strategy with respect to AI with the Notre Dame um, index that uh, combines the vulnerability and the readiness to mitigate to climate change and the two maps can be perfectly or almost perfectly overlapped and um, like low-income countries are not ready for AI, both in terms of infrastructure and uh, skills because of brain drain and, um, in general, uh, public spending in education, but yet they are the net exporters of all the critical materials that are necessary for both the digital and green transition. And looking at the current policies in these two fields, uh, an OECD um, policy uh, review has uh, found that ev like over, um, among over 60 countries um, that have introduced policies in the field of AI, they all um, um, they do not put into discussion the reliance on big tech clouds and services. And also with respect to regulation, um, 190 countries have, um, have um, adopted non-binding recommendations with respect to the ethical use of AI and even the uh, European Union regulation, which is the most uh, detailed uh, act um, in this, uh, that deals with AI, uh, does not question the power of, of big tax. So here it comes to our final questions that are which institutions and policies are needed for the democratization of the green and di digital transition processes? How can we reconcile the need for redistribution and the just, tr just transition with the risk of techno-nationalism and conflicts? And with techno-nationalism, we uh, refer to a closure and like the loss of uh, the advantages that comes from economies of scale um, with respect to infrastructure and whatever. And also, um, a second question is regards to when the state is an unreliable actor, what kind of strategies can guarantee the success of um, solutions like a data tax or uh, digital commons and public uh, digital infrastructure that are contingent to some level on government action? And the third one is, to what extent is China's AI industry different from the US big tech? And does it represent a new paradigm? Or does it just rep replicate the same intellectual monopolization dynamics? And of course, what alternatives exist for the global south beyond subjection to these hegemonies? Thank you. No, I will answer in four minutes because I, I've spoken a lot. So, yeah. So, the, the short answer to question number three is that it's the same. Of course, this, it's the same with a lot of differences, but ultimately, and why I'm, I'm emphasizing the side that it's the same, it's because for a lot of people, in particular in different governments, like people from the Brazilian government, for instance, it was very hard to explain that actually China is not a role model. China is still reproducing the intellectual monopolization structure with its own big tech. Understanding why and how China managed to get its own big tech is also relevant because it shows how impossible it is to replicate the strategy. So even if uh, one still wants to have its European champions, it will not work. It will simply not work because 
all the Euro all the European companies, European organizations at large, all of you, all of us, we already use and we are already completely sold on big tech cloud and other platforms. That was not the case in China at that time. So it's not just a matter of money and, and protectionist policies. It's also a matter of where we are and how you can, from where you are, what is feasible. So this, I, I will finish a bit with the strategies and I will just uh, unplug to plug because we we had a sort of, of course, to make things better, you need to plan. And of course, this was to some extent planned. Uh, this meaning what uh, the uh, the students' presentation and my presentation, it's not just by chance that they were so aligned. And is it coming, maybe, sometime? Yeah, it, it's coming, it's coming. So it's not just that, yeah, they were like out of serendipity very much aligned it they were aligned because we discuss ahead of the of the joint seminar so so let me go a bit into what can be done and and in a way the three questions are very much related because we need to think of alternatives and solutions but that solutions cannot automatically be for instance all the power to states because as much as we can uh, in a romantic way think of states that as democratic solutions and states are more transparent, states are, have also checks and balances, so there are ways in which we can definitely say, at least in most of the countries in the world, we vote those that are then ruling. I may dislike Millet with all my heart, but it was voted by the majority of the Argentinians, so still that is better than corporate rulers that were not chosen by anyone in any democratic process. But having said this, this doesn't mean that we need to leave every government, no matter who's ruling and, and, and what their purposes are, all the power that these companies now are capable of exercising. So the question ultimately is a very relevant question because we need to think very strategically in terms of solutions that are not naive also, and I very briefly mentioned the case of open source, like when we think of uh, strategies to give the power back to the people, what better than open sourcing? We share the knowledge, we collaboratively all together co-produce the, the, and develop the technology, and then that is conquered by big tech. So we clearly need to be very clever and think and st a step ahead because all the easy solutions at hand backfire and end up making them even stronger. And this is why I always start when thinking about what to do with what we shouldn't do. So just putting more money out there, as the European Commission is going to do, like trying to fund more AI startups and fund more Horizon projects and so on, will reproduce all the things that we discuss here today. The other solution that is constantly being discussed, digital public infrastructure, double click there. It's not that what the European Commission and others are discussing is to really create the material layers that big tech have absolute control over. It's not a, cl a Europe European cloud. Europe tried to have its cloud, for instance, but it failed. And if you, the European Commission failed and ended up calling Amazon for help, imagine how bad we are at for in the case of peripheral countries. But digital public infrastructure basically is the creation of a layer that runs on top of these clouds with, that can be described as universal platforms. For instance, digital IDs, payment systems, and the third one is data exchanges. Might be a data market, might be something different. And what big tech companies, even Bill Gates with its foundation and so on, are pushing for is for all the governments in the world to develop that sort of inclusion of digital subjects. But more digital subjects means more subjects that will be producing data and that will be consuming the services of these companies. So if these solutions are not working. If the other ones, like just saying, this needs to be in the hands of the states, and then we say, oh, oops, but surveillance and Project Nimbus and the US state, it, the hands of, like all our data in the hands of the US state, well, I, I, I assure you that it will not be much better than where we are now. So what can we do? And I think that there is a space for many things. Short, like short-term changes, antitrust. Antitrust is trapped in this idea of markets as uh, independent institutions. Instead of seeing markets as interconnected, as a network actually of interconnected markets. Because they are trapped with this idea, they end up always chasing things that have already happened many years before. And we need to 
try to change antitrust to make it more like retrofitted and, and updated with uh, what actually is happening in the tech sector. For instance, recognizing that certain engines operate as what in economics we call natural monopolies. And the solution to a natural monopoly is not more competition. It's having ideally an expropriation of Google and the search engine being operated by a public consortium. I will come back to that. Taxing these companies is a short-term solution. It's a way to control what they are doing. And there are different ways of taxing them. Of course, we also need to expand the absorptive capacities of the population. And this is a condition sine qua non. If people don't understand by the time we make whatever public public, whatever should be public in terms of knowledge public, no one will understand. So these are not easy, but shorten things that could be done. And really the way, and, and I don't say that this is a recipe by no means, I don't think that I'm capable or myself with the people that I discuss this type of things, it's enough, like in terms of heads working together to find a solution, so please do not get me wrong. I'm not saying like this is like, absolutely what should be done out of the question. But where I am now and the things that I've been discussing with many so far is that really we need to embrace the idea of planning, but in a more creative way, and the idea of democratic planning in a different way. We can think of international organizations, we can think of organizations at the level of the UN. I know that the UN is also a, a lobby space for big tech, and more and more with this idea of multi-stakeholders is an open door so they, that they can sit on the table. I know that, but having said that, that doesn't mean that we should just give away the, the UN to them. So if, for instance, it was possible for all the countries in the world, more or less, to arrive at agreements in terms of the postal service, and we have a global postal service, I'm sure you use La Poste, for instance, here. Uh, it's impossible to live in France without using it. It's possible to actually think of a solution along the same lines, to think of a, an international solution that will help us in different ways. First, it will prevent governments like Millet's government in Argentina to get access to the data of the people that is stored in a truly public cloud. So what we need are truly state-led solutions, but this state-led solution cannot be in the hands of one single state of government. Not only because of the surveillance uh, and, and, and potential risks related to the technology itself, but also because it's really expensive and it would be impossible, and this is where I connected to peripheral countries, it would be impossible for peripheral countries to actually be capable of doing it by themselves. So that would require ultimately new institutions, new institutions where knowledge is collectively produced, that including in those institutions also the idea of public and free education. And it also requires to rework on our common senses in terms of data. The solution to free harvesting of data by a few companies is not to create a market where we sell our individual data. That's a still a quite commodified and privatizing solution. The solution is to think of data as something that we can share under certain conditions and with those that we want to share it with. So if we could think of when, how, and how to explain people what their data will be used for and so on, I think that there is a space to one, work collaboratively and share our data, two, produce collaboratively models and, and frontier research when and where it's necessary. And this is also a reason why it needs to be democratically planned. It's not AI for everything. There are many things that do not require AI, so we also need to kill the hype. And to kill the hype, we need a centrally planned democratic solution. So basically, I know it's not easy, but this would be my answer to a set of like all your questions. And this also solves the problem of techno-nationalism, because definitely the solution is not to fight one country against the other, it's actually to work together. And what better goal or purpose than trying to prevent us from all dying together with the extinction of the world as we know it. Do you have questions? Hi, uh, Cecilia or Cecilia, how do you say it? Cecilia. Cecilia. So um, it was a wonderful presentation. I loved it after Rome. My question to you is very simple. Uh, we began with the stagnation of the productivity growth graphic, where we saw that the, despite all those innovations and technological revolutions, the productivity hasn't grown. Now, in Rome, we studied from Professor Sterati that there exists a caldor ferdorn law, where output growth determine the productivity growth, uh, the causality is like that, and they established in the Western European countries that 
the autonomous demand part of output growth influences the productivity growth in manufacturing sector the most. So what is your opinion on the autonomous demand, uh, autonomous, autonomous part of the aggregate demand not influencing the service sector productivity? Hi, Cecilia, thank you. I'm Felisa from Brazil. I have actually a lot of questions, but I'm just going to focus on the. <laughs> so uh, I would like to understand if from you what you said that could be like could exist a balance between like using these companies to build the transition to a like the green transition regarding like the the way they are like consuming energy. Do you believe there is this possible? I would really like to listen your opinion on that. And also, if you could talk a little bit about like how we were in Brazil, I think it was last month with Enapi and like developing and helping the Brazilian government with the digital plan, I would like to listen a little bit about that too. Thank you. I'm gonna ask my question since the mic's at me now. Um, so I, I had two questions. One is I think very related to this question, which is, um, is there? So is, uh, the first is about the yeah the, the stagnation of. It's uh, what aggregate worker output. Am I correct there? Is there one way of characterizing that, or w would one way of thinking about that be in terms of like what Ivan Illich would call like an um, like a watershed in terms of like the productivity made possible by um, capitalist industrial innovation, and that innovation at this point functions rather as a way to de-skill and displace labor and work rather than actually increase. Um, yeah, productivity. Uh, that was the first question. And the second question is about um, the, um, you talked about the, um, this kind of, yeah, the way that uh, companies are kind of reaching into and planning beyond their own kind of like limits and restructuring these kind of spheres of innovation. Some of them being kind of these non-market spheres of innovation like, co like um, open source and things like this. And I know that, uh, like Nancy Fraser talks, like this reminded me of kind of Nancy Fraser's whole analysis of these spheres of accumulation, these hidden spheres of accumulation for capital, which are not only active spheres of accumulation, but are also actively kind of undermined by capital's predation upon them. And I was wondering if you've seen this in what you've looked at. Is there a way in which they're not only restructuring for their own benefit, but also undermining these sources of innovation? So, um, so short answers. I, I will go backwards and say just a few things for each. So, yes, absolutely. Actually, in my new book on on this, like how they are undermined these other spheres. Um, actually, I speak of the idea of epistemic totalitarianism, which is a way in which we can think of how other forms of producing knowledge, other types of knowledge are completely marginalized. So it's not, not only that are appropriated, and you can think of the case of biopiracy and how all the indigenous populations were already using a lot of plants for treatments, and then they are simply used by pharma companies and then patented by the pharma companies as an example that is not just about tech and how they control open source, for instance. So yes, absolutely, they are at the same time undermined and not simply uh, a subject of this relationship more on a typical capitalist way, if you want. Uh, on the questions about stagnation, I would just, uh, I, I will just say one more thing that I think is crucial for the discussion that we had today. Um, the first thing is that I'm I'm trying to work uh, with a PhD student from that I'm supervising within the Epoch PhD network on trying to measure a lot of this. So part of the so I don't want to go super further because all these are more my analytical conclusions from my more if you want industrial organizations research and how that leads into a different explanation for stagnation. But definitely in terms of the de-skilling, one thing that I didn't say is that. Although we can even say that we still don't, don't know the final equation because people, it's true that they are de-skilled in certain respects, but we could still claim that they are re-skilled in how to prompt an AI or how to work with an AI and so on and so forth. One thing that it's clearly happening is a universalization of AI as a method of invention. As that progresses, it displaces also other ways of producing knowledge. So it's a way of generating a sort of like unique 
way of producing creative things that is affecting not only science but also the arts in general and that is dangerous and for all of you it's very easy to think in terms of what happens to economics when it becomes just mainstream and why we need confrontation and different ways of thinking and how that enables us to progress and move forward if we only have one way of analyzing problems we are also going to lose all that richness from pluralism and diversity so I would say that even if in the total of that equation the result is like we are more skilled than before which for me it wouldn't make sense because we cannot count the skills in the same way that we cannot count innovation or knowledge uh, shall we say that an AI model uh, can be counted as one and then one the concept of the cell and then one the concept of how to build a computer really if you think about it it's not like counting potatoes or shoes it really doesn't make sense um, in terms of what I did in Brazil, it was very long and really I don't know where to start. I can perhaps put everyone on the same page of, of why you asked that question. I was in Ju late July and early August working with people from the uh, Ministry of uh, Innovation pub for the public sector, if you want, and also with the Ministry for uh, Trade, Industry, Development and probably some other things because there are very long names in those ministries in Brazil and also people from the central government in Brazil and, and a few others uh, discussing about their AI plan and what to really prioritize from what they had done. Uh, in Brazil there is part of the administration that wants to and go forward towards a solution that is independent from big tech, which actually is the only one that can work. It's impossible, answering your other question, it's impossible to think of a solution with big tech. Because it's impossible to tell people tomorrow you will lose everything that you have because basically turning off, like even the most, the, the hardest part of uh, finding that Google is a monopoly for the US is what you do next. Because if what you do next in part involves worsening the service that people get, your citizens will get against you. So you really need to build an, alter build an alternative that is better, better in many ways, not necessarily uh, for everything it will be technologically better, but it needs to be better in terms of solving people's problems. So part of the solution for me comes from rethinking why we are interested in technology. So I was I teach at a master's in public administration at UCL and we receive a lot of people from different governments. And I had a stu I have a student that works for the Indonesian government and he came to me at the end of the class and told me my government my the president is asking us to say what to prioritize in terms of science and technology. Can you help me? Like imagine that question. Of course I the first part of the answer is I'm not an expert in Indonesia. I cannot provide you an answer to what to do and one single person certainly cannot do it. But there is one thing that I can say and it's why do you want science and technology? What problems do you have in Indonesia? What are the problems that the people and, and more generally you can think of internationally like ecological breakdown is clearly a priority but, that, that, but from that doesn't follow automatically that what you need is more AI or the latest AI. So really I think that part of the solution also comes from an independent alternative that is not just chasing big tech and trying to replace them in everything they are they are doing but to put first the needs of the people the needs of the planet and from there think of the role that different forms of knowledge production including also the arts can and how they can contribute so it's it's a very long term and kind of somehow idea idealistic a way of thinking i know but it's the only one that could potentially work and probably it won't i'm so sorry i mean probably i'm very pessimistic probably we're all go i mean on top of all going to die the planet is going to die but if there is a chance to save it then we really need to be bold and I'm, 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 I'm saying it in, in, in part joking but not really I'm not joking I think that there are no band-aids here I mean if we for band-aids like we can I don't know just go and do something else if we really want to change the world we need to be bold in terms of how we think about changing it this is why the my insistence on the the things that backfire and so on because I I've been working with a lot of people that are very interesting very clever and then when the policy moment arrives they say more investment in science and technology, uh, increase the, create a new branch within Horizon that will give two million, two billion dollars for that. And then you listen Microsoft saying that they're investing two billion only in Brazil. And at the same time, in other parts of the world, more and more. So really, really 
trying to just chase them and do the, the, like the business as usual from the state sector will not work. More questions? Many thanks for the presentation. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be quick. I would like to come back to the idea that you mentioned about your single solutions backfiring and about the naivety of something like open source and stuff like that. Um, would you say that it's actually a counterproductive movement in the bigger picture to like all these bottom-up solutions like digital commons, open source, stuff like that. And if that is the case, how could a sensible and non-naive bottom-up activism look like? Uh, my question is something related to what you've just mentioned a minute ago, and it's how can innovations like AI be protected from falling under this intellectual monopoly trap in the hands of certain countries or corporations? Because as things stand, the current system fully enables that, so what kind of measures or amendments could be undertaken to start moving away from the current state? Um. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about the Chinese digital Silk Road and uh, how do you see this in uh, this international competition uh, among the digital frontier with the US? Uh, and I wanted to ask about how you mentioned that innovation is a so. Uh, I wanted to ask how you mentioned that innovation is a social relation and then you also mentioned how it is related to the military technology nexus. So I wanted to ask that on which part of like intangibles like data, narratives or knowledge should we be focusing upon our efforts to prevent the current surveillance technology, to, like f prevent it from growing basically? All. Thank you. I'm Juan Castillo from Mexico. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just want to ask when you talk about the end of employment and informality, expansion of informality, if the if this uh, dichotomy between formal and informal uh, job is like no longer valid with which with this sense with increase of uh, speed and like value different value perception and generation and if like with this end of employment we think of panoptical and discipline is the control that you talk about over the workers like limited to the workers or are we somehow uh, employees of the big tech or like something okay this is very hard this part will be very very hard bottom-up solutions I um, I, I mentioned that I did these interviews for my new book. My new book will be unfortunately published only in September next year, but I can already tell you how it ends. The, the, the last sentence of the book says, let 1,000 coordinated and planned flowers bloom, which means that I do believe that there is a space for bottom-up solutions, but, they, but we need, and, and while, um, in a way, well, we cannot coordinate among each other, in principle, just continue doing them. But really, what we need, what we lack, is this layer of coordination, is this layer of communication and coordination. And, and I'm trying to work on that on different regards. The question about Brazil, I'm trying to work with the people from Brazil to put them in touch with people from La France and Sumis, and to put them in touch with people from the Buenos Aires province in Argentina. So I'm from where I am, I try to connect the, at least the people that are thinking along the same lines. Also, after the we, I, I drafted a letter of support to the Brazilian government that then, and then I one by one waste a lot of my time to get the signatures of a lot of people. And after that, a lot of more, like many more people signed. And then from there, we decided to, that we were going to create uh, with different colleagues, like Cedric Durand, who also teaches in the Epoch, but also others like Edemilson Paraná and Paolo Gerbaudo. We created a working group on digital sovereignty. And we are working with, like, uh, in, the, in the group, we have 70 people showing up 40, like writing together a white paper on what it is and what is not digital sovereignty. So I think that, again, trying to put people together and build networks from the bottom up can also influence those that are making the decisions on, and, and provide more feasible solutions to them. But uh, still, I think that always the answer comes to no worries, no worries. The it's getting worse. Okay, thank you. So, so it still c comes to the 
planning part. So we still, so yes to bottom-up solutions. Of course, I don't think that it's just a matter of coordinating among states or creating at the UN level just new institutions. I also believe that there is a lot of space for bottom-up and different focuses within that bottom-up, but they need to be, one, well-informed and two, coordinated. Then, um, wait, 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 yeah. Uh, how can AI be protected from more intellectual monopolization? And it goes this, and, and it's the same for every form of knowledge. The question ultimately is, how can we prevent knowledge extractivism in all its forms? And I think that certainly one of the things that needs to be done yesterday is to change the way in which scholars are evaluated. We are assessed by publishing papers. People, that has many, many drawbacks. Among them, the fact that scholars do not engage really in big challenging questions because you need to publish them very briefly, very fast. But more importantly for our discussion is that when you're constantly publishing everything as you're thinking it, you're also sharing that knowledge with those with the most advanced absorptive capacities. So while a new, while a new solution is being developed, I do think especially for sensitive AI or for the development of foundational foundation AI models for specific things, unfortunately, they need to be kept secret. We, we can, in the current scenario, we we cannot assume that all forms of open science are automatically good. So unfortunately, and as hard as it is to say it, I do believe that we need to play under the secrecy strategy in some respects. For that to work, it's indispensable to have digital infrastructure, the true one, the servers, the cables. We need to reappropriate all that or invest in all that. It's not. And, and without that, it's impossible to think of all the other layers. So um, about the question of where to focus, I would think, I would say that the priority needs to make sure that we have the material uh, investments so that, because we have the brains of the people. And a lot of people, and I interviewed a lot of people that basically left to work for big tech companies among others because there they had all the resources. So I, I am convinced that part of them can be uh, brought back. I am convinced that new people that are being trained as we speak do want to make the world truly better, but if they are not offered the resources to do it, and that includes the processors, the data centers more in general, but also includes data, but I will say one word about data, it will be impossible to make it. The data is already there. One of the things that, uh, the, going back to answering a bit more of what I was doing in Brazil, um, the Brazilian government is very much concerned because Brazil, the Brazilian government has a very good national statistics office, has a lot of data from a very diverse population. Big tech are like desperate to get that data, of course. And that data is a very good resource to, if you think about it from a data solidarity perspective, for doing uh, different types of priority analysis, for instance, for healthcare or for identifying environmental problems in society. So I, I do think in terms of where to focus, I said everything, but I do think that having this material part is indispensable. And I also think that we often forget the narrative part, and we cannot forget it. We really need to also work on building other common senses. Narrative is not just brand building and, and selling things that are a lie. We also need to really think of what is a, what how would our ideal society be? What are the things that we need to change? What does solidarity mean? All this is also a part of how we reproduce ourselves as human beings. And if the narratives are all captured by these companies, then they will keep on saying that uh, regulation stifles innovation that we, that, and, and all the other related things. Um, I think we need to stop here, unfortunately. Happy to continue discussing and answering the other questions uh, with you afterwards there or yeah, during your small break. And yeah, and I'm so sorry that I spoke so, for so long and I didn't have the time to answer for some of the questions. Thanks for being here. <laughs>